everyone, welcome back to my channel. This is Heidi from My Reading Life and I'm here today to do my March wrap up. So in this wrap up, I would like to talk about all of the books that I didn't sort of in any way review in any of my other videos in the month of March. Um, and some books maybe I mentioned briefly in a vlog but then didn't get back to and actually talk about what I thought about them. So I just wanna wrap up those books that I hadn't really finished up on in the month of March. Um, before I get started, I just want to point out my new t-shirt that I just got, um, Empowered Women Can Empower the World, which was um, a t-shirt that was for Women's History Month and I got it for clearance price, so yay me. Um, and let's just get into these books. I'm not going to talk about my Book 2 Prize reading, which was quite a bit of the reading that I did in the month of March because I've reviewed those elsewhere. Uh, same for Ecology of a Cracker Childhood, which was the Book Naturalist Book Club pick for the month of March, which I did an a individual review for uh, just a few days ago. So I read 14 books total in the month of March, and these are just some books that I read and then just never got back to for whatever reason to tell you about. So the first one I'd like to bring back to your attention is this nonfiction book called Bitch in Praise of Difficult Women by Elizabeth Wurzel. This book was first published in 1998, and this is by the best-selling author of Prozac Nation, which I also did not read. I think I picked this up at a library book sale somewhere along the way. This was a book that was on my ancient TBR shelves, um, and I uh, tried it, and it was one of those books where while I was reading it, I was like, there's an awful lot of problematic um, thinking in this book. It really is... Uh, dated in terms of its thinking about women and women's roles in the world. But uh, the author uses a lot of um, famous women and like sort of Hollywood stars and other media types, music um, singers and things to illustrate her points about difficult women and how our culture like pigeonholes women into these certain roles um, based on behavior. And, um, you know, there's, there's a whole chapter in here about, like, uh, Mary Kay Letourneau, if you remember that from the 90s. Um, there's a lot in here about O.J. Simpson and Nicole Simpson. Um, there's just a lot in here about how men are allowed to get away with certain behaviors that women are not allowed with, allowed to get away with that gets them labeled crazy or a slut or a bitch or whatever. And so while some of that thinking I thought was quite interesting, I think a lot of it is um, of its time and um, not really how we think about women today. Um, but like I said, the, the examples that she uses that are sort of from pop culture were like a train wreck that I couldn't look away from. So this is sort of an average read, um, interesting, but nothing in there that I think is earth shattering or groundbreaking. Um, and then another book that I read for Women's History Month was White Feminism by Koa Beck. I did a buddy read with Britta Bowler about this book. And um, while I think the premise of the book, which was uh, the women that white feminists left behind in the feminist movement, I think that premise is really excellent premise and something that we all need to, especially white women, need to learn more about. Um, the problem for me was the author didn't pull her examples together into a coherent explanation of her theme that is stated on the cover of the book. So I kept wanting the book to be more uh, sort of getting to the point of white feminism and how white feminism have left these groups behind, but it was really more just an explanation of different kinds of um, ways to be female and different experiences that different females have in the world, whether they be black, whether they be lesbian, whether they be you know, other minority groups that have been uh, marginalized over time. And that information was really useful and interesting and informative, but it didn't sort of tie together into what I thought her thesis was based on the subtitle of her book. So I think that the title and the subtitle really did a disservice to the book as a whole. Koa Beck is a very good writer. She was a very engaging writer. I, I was interested the whole time. I listened to it on audiobook and she reads it herself. And so I think you know, that was a good experience, but I just felt like the book was kind of all over the place. I wish it had just been marketed as a essay collection about femininity in all of its forms and ways in which people have been left out of society or ways that people are um, excluded from different things in society. And I think especially, uh, I should say, how women have been excluded 
in society and how women have been left out. Certain kinds of women have been left out. Um, but I didn't think Koa Beck did a good job of sort of relating everything that she was writing about to uh, the title and subtitle of her book. And so that therefore it just became a frustrating exercise for me of trying to like figure out how all these things tied together. That was my experience of that book. Um, but I will say that I do think there's a lot of important information in there that was useful for me to read about. So I was glad that I read it in the end. Um, and then a book that I DNF'd that also came from my ancient TBR shelf is this uh, mystery thriller, I guess, called What She Knew by Gilly or Jilly McMillan. Again, I picked this up from a church sale, I think for a quarter. Um, and it's supposedly about a woman who... Um, goes for a walk in a park with her eight-year-old son and her son runs ahead and then he disappears and nobody can find him. And it's uh, what happens to her afterwards as they're looking for her son. And I think it, it um, you know, it, it, there's two voices or two, two characters that we are following. I only got through the first three or four chapters of this book and then I was like... I didn't really care about anybody. I didn't really want to read about um, somebody whose kid was abducted. That is not ever anything I want to read about. Um, and so I just decided, you know what? I didn't, I wasn't invested. I didn't want to read about it. So I'm just going to put it down. So that one got DNF'd, um, but off my TBR. So that was a success for me. Um, I then finished a book on ebook, another nonfiction. It was called The Black Cabinet by Jill Watts. This was a buddy read with Doris and Patrice and Karen from Run Right Reads. And this nonfiction book was all about the um, Black Cabinet, uh, the, the Black American advisors to the um, Franklin Roosevelt presidential administration and even before that in the starting in the um, years of Teddy Roosevelt's presidency the black advisors that sort of operated in the federal administration but never were really given the official titles of advisors um, they may have held federal jobs but they often played the role of furthering black uh black issues to the president and to the upper echelons of federal government to try to to try to um bring forward more equality um for black people in america and to try to right some of the wrongs that were happening in the country at the time so this book really spans the years from like early 1900s like 1912 1913 all the way through world war ii and even into um you know, the 50s, uh, the 1950s. So uh, we follow several main characters, but the, the most prominent the most prominent historical figure that we follow in this book is um, Mary Bethune, who was um, really um, one of the most prominent people, one of the most prominent movers and shakers in, um, in the federal government at that time to try to further the interests of black Americans and to try to bring, um, try to bring more equality to black Americans at that time. And she was just a tireless, tireless promoter of the, the black race. And she had a very, um, interesting and close relationship with Eleanor Roosevelt. And that was the channel that she often worked to bring her concerns to the president. Um, and I thought this book was really, really well done. It was super interesting. There are a lot of characters and I cannot remember the names of all of them. Um, Bethune was really the central figure that I was interested in. I was really interested in her relationship with Eleanor Roosevelt, who I am really fascinated by. Um, but I think it's, it's, it was an important book to read because so often that period of time between Reconstruction and the Civil Rights era of the 60s is not something that we know an awful lot about in terms of how Black Americans were impacted by, say, the policies of the New Deal, um, World War II, all that stuff. And a lot of the things that uh, came out in this book also reminded me um, of the fiction book, The Last Thing You Surrender by Leonard Pitts Jr., which was the... Um, read so lit pick um from Dee Dee at brown girl reading i think two years ago or maybe even three years ago i can't remember now i think two years ago that was her pick for the read so lit um read along and that book was so fabulous and i think the black cabinet 
there's so much resonance between those two books. So if you're interested in reading like a fiction and a nonfiction pairing that sort of describes what life was like for Black Americans in that Reconstruction period and certainly through World War II and the New Deal, I think those two books pair really well together. And I am really happy that I read The Black Cabinet. I learned a ton from that book and it's, it was really fascinating. And there was a bunch of stuff in there that made me want to like go down rabbit holes and learn more about... Um, about some of these folks, like, uh, for example, Bethune wrote um, a newspaper column, um, like for many, many years. And not in her column was all about the black experience in America and how the New Deal programs were impacting black Americans. And at that same time, Eleanor Roosevelt was also writing a newspaper column all about what life was like for Americans in general. Um, so that's something that I want to read more about as well in the future. So very fascinating book. Really glad that I read that book with my buddy readers. And then lastly, the last book I completed in the month of March was this graphic novel called Paying the Land by Joe Sacco. And this book was fabulous. I had picked this book up first. Um, I had seen it um, on Sean the Book Maniac's channel. And then I think Doris picked it up and read it. And this is just a really fantastic nonfiction. I shouldn't call it a graphic novel because it's not a novel. It is um, nonfiction graphic work all about uh, indigenous tribal people in the northern part of Canada. Um, so a lot of the Dene and other tribes that lived up in the very upper northern part of Canada where now um, there's a lot of resource extraction and fracking and things like that going on. Um, this is in the Mackenzie River Valley, excuse me, in the Canadian Northwest Territories. So this book details um, how the indigenous peoples that are from that area, like what what life was like for them in the past, what life is like for them now, how some tribes have negotiated settlements with the Canadian government um, for federal status and now are using those negotiations that, that has allowed them to enter into um, economic economic deals with resource resource extraction um, projects on their territories and how some other uh, tribal nations have decided not to go that route um, and why and why not, why some of them have decided to go that way and why some of them haven't. It details um, a little bit about how uh, members of these tribes, you know, when they were young, when they were children, got taken away from their families and sent to residential schools in Canada and, you know, some t some cases for years and years and decades, separated from their families and from their home um, and what that does to a person emotionally and psychologically and then how that plays out through generations um, socially in these communities and in these families. Just absolutely heartbreaking to read about. Um, this book combines um, black and white line drawings with um, text and I think that Joe Sacco is an excellent author in terms of telling the story like he went to these places and he interviewed many 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 people and he's telling their stories and it's just fascinating and then his artwork which is so so detailed and I could just look at this book for hours this book took me much longer than um, I normally take to read a graphic novel because I just wanted to like stare at each block of these um you know each panel of the graphic uh of this piece of graphic uh nonfiction to really get all the details like in me right it's just so beautiful um so I will definitely be reading more from Joe Sacco in the future I know he's you know, he has uh, read, uh, he's written a bunch of stuff about Palestine and, and Israel and things like that. And so I want to pick up more of his stuff um, and read more of his stuff. But this, I highly, highly recommend if you're looking to get into more graphic works of nonfiction, um, I think that Joe Sacco's work is a great place to start. So that's it. That's all the stuff um, that I had not yet talked about from the month of March. I hope that you also read some great books in the month of March um, and I hope that you're finding some great books to read now in April and I will talk to you later.